Okay, so I think we'll start the next lecture now. My name is Adrian Jackson from EPCC as well. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit in the next hour about some of the internals to the computer, which may be of interest to you if you're programming or using these, these computers. So the hardware we're using, and then how programs run on that hardware. Okay, just if you have any questions, please do just shout at me. If you can't hear me, let me know. Um, but so most of the time I, I would talk to programmers and I would say, oh, well, if you're doing the programming you're doing, you don't really need to care about what's underneath there. You just need to care about the programming language and how you use it. But of course, we're here in the, in the realm of high performance computing, where we're in a particular environment where we really care about how well our programs run, how, how quickly our programs run. Um, primarily, we're only really using high performance computing because we want to do some science, some research, um, and the computers we have available to us take too long to run our programs. Right? So people generally start off and they'll They'll be investigating a new bit of theory, they'll write some maths, they'll maybe do that in MATLAB. They'll run that on the computer and, and try to an analyse some aspects of their theory. And then they'll realise that when they're trying to look at big problems or for large timescales and these kind of things, MATLAB takes a long time. So then they'll port it to something else, C, Fortran, C++, one of these things. But then they'll still find that it takes months or years to run a large problem that they're interested in. Right? Even if you start off on small problems that run quickly, you're always interested in bigger problems, larger data sets, longer times, more molecules, whatever it is you're doing. So that pushes you to high performance computing, i.e. taking multiple computers and linking them together to try and speed up this process. Or look at new hardware like GPUs which can do things faster. Right? So we're always in this space where you care about how fast your program runs because that's why you're doing high performance computing, that's why you're using it, it's just a resource, it's just a machine, but you're here because you're trying to get your results faster or you're trying to get your results at all. And because of that, actually you need to understand a little bit or it's useful to understand a little bit of what the hardware looks like underneath and where the performance limitations are on the hardware and that lets you be a better programmer but also, even if you're not writing your own programs, it lets you be a better user. So, the machine that you've been, by all accounts, intermittently using, Archer, a um, large system, most of our users on this, we have 3,000 users, most of them don't write their own code. So 70 plus percent of the people there don't write their own code at all. They use packages which are already installed on the system, large scale modeling things, materials packages like CP2K or Castep or VASP. Weather forecasting packages like the Unified Model. There's all sorts of software already installed that people just use as a research tool. But even in that case, it's useful to understand what the hardware of Archer looks like underneath because when you're submitting a job, when you're getting a job ready to run, if you know it's a node with 24 cores in it, uh, but if you're underusing those cores, it's best to spread them across the processors and it's got this amount of memory and this is where a disk fits. You can actually run your jobs more efficiently, or at least it can save you from making mistakes. So we have people who, because we don't fully understand Archer, sometimes accidentally they ask for 100 nodes but only use 60 of them and 40 of them sit there doing nothing. And they end up getting a uh, charge for those that are not using, right? But it's just because they didn't quite understand how the hardware was laid out underneath. <coughs> and they thought they were using them all, but they weren't. So that's why we talk about this. I don't... I'm not going to, I mean, you could talk for, for years about hardware architecture and software architecture, but really I just want to give you a basic understanding of the little different components we have and then where they, you may see them in the software stack and where you may see performance issues with them. So first we'll talk about hardware and then we'll go into a lecture about software. We have the usual uh, Creative Commons license and uh, what have you. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk... First about just a general hardware layout inside computers, where performance sits in there, and then some of the, a bit more detail on some of the hardware we've seen more recently and where you can get parallelism in the hardware. So high performance computing is generally synonymous with parallelism, trying to use more resources than you have access into a single computer to get your problem to run fast. 
Um, just before we go any further, I always like to put these in just to, we, to remind people that computers actually are very right. There is a very wide range of things that are called computers. So we have a very narrow view of what a computer is, which is a digital device. Uh, for us, a digital device with large-scale floating point units in it. But people are doing, you know, there's computers all around, there's lots of embedded devices, and people doing random things here. So that's a computer there. Oh, I forgot you're not allowed to touch this board, are you? That's a computer there. That's a 3D analog computer, which uses a big uh, tin of jelly to, to solve 3D um, um, partial differential equations by passing current in at the top and then measuring it at various places at the bottom. And actually something like that potentially is much, much more efficient at doing that calculation than, than Archer is. Of course, it's a bit harder to set up, and if you want to change your equation slightly, you probably have to get the jelly out and mix something in with it and put it back in and then put your sensors in. So in reality, it's not as, as beneficial, but you, know, uh, you do exactly the same thing. The people who built that started off in 2D analog computing, so this is doing exactly the same thing. It looks a bit like a computer, but actually the thing that's doing the computing is this thing E at the side here, which is a big black piece of foam. And again, it's passing charge from one end of that foam to the other. And this electronic to the side here is just interpreting the results that come out of it. And of course, more generally, we have other forms of computing which are becoming more interested in quantum computing. For instance, there's a company called D-Wave that make a quantum, com a semi-quantum computer which is out there. Um, people are looking at what things they call neuromorphic computing. Lots of different kinds of computing going out there. When we're talking about computing, we're looking at something more traditional, something like this. So it could be you know, a laptop or a desktop or a server machine. They're all effectively set up in the same way. You have something which has a processor inside it. It has some memory attached to that processor. And then it has some kind of storage device, a hard disk or a network attached storage system associated with it. Turns out for scientific computing, because for a lot of, for the majority of the work you're doing in scientific computational simulation, you care about floating point numbers, not, not integer stuff, and for the kind of computers we care about, we look a lot at the performance of this thing called the floating point unit inside, the, the part of the processor which does the floating point arithmetic, adding and subtracting numbers with decimal points. Um, but it also have a memory hierarchy which actually has quite a big impact on performance we'll come and talk about. So the processor will have a cache or some levels of cache inside it. It has a base clock frequency which uh, uh, affects the performance. Now a lot of these things don't really change the way you program or interact with a computer but they can impact the performance of computers. So if this processor is running at 1 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz you still program it and use it in the same way, it's just at 2 gigahertz, it runs twice as fast as it did at 1 gigahertz. But actually, as we'll come on to talk about, for most scientific programs, the speed of the processor is not the thing that really affects your performance. It's generally the speed of the memory that you're using. Not for all programs, but for, this, but for most of them. Just as we have, now I don't have a picture of it, just as we have a set of units inside the computer, a set of different things that do different functionality. We also have some kind of hierarchy inside the computer in terms of performance. So getting data on and off disks, on and off storage, is very slow compared to how fast the processor can run. Um, the next level up is what we call main memory. So this is main memory RAM. You know, a machine like mine here might have eight gigabytes, four gigabytes of RAM. It's got a disk which is 512 gigabytes. So the disk is slow, but large, and it will store my data long term. The memory is smaller, but much faster. So the memory is much faster than disk, but it's still slower than my processor. Okay, and that's a problem for us nowadays. Actually, if you look at in terms of performance, the main memory is somewhere in the region of a thousand to ten thousand times slower than our processor. So that means that if I have to go and get a bit of data from my main memory onto my processor, I could have done ten thousand instructions in the time that data's 
come to the process. So we have to have, wait for that data to come to the process. So effectively, I'm losing, t uh, you know, I'm only getting a 10,000th of my performance when I'm running my um, processor. That's just the way the technology has progressed. Processors have got much faster, memory has got faster, but at a slower rate. And it just means that memory nowadays is much slower than processors. How do we get around that? Well, what we do is we build processors with a small amount of much faster memory called cache on board. So although going all the way out to my main memory may take me a long time compared to how, long, how quick my processor runs, I have a little bit of fast memory close to my processor which I can access much quicker. So quite often you have multiple levels of cache, but the L1 cache, the cache which is closest to my processor, I can probably get data from that in five or ten instructions. So if I need my data, I can go and get it and I can and, uh, go and work on it very, very quickly. Um, then you'll have, but, but that would be a very small amount of memory. You maybe only have a couple of megabytes of L1 cache. Then you can go down another level, which will be slightly slower, but slightly larger memory. And we, we have these levels of cache to try and get over this problem um, of main memory and, and even disk being slow. And we need the data on the processor to be able to efficiently work on it. Because of that, you know, naively, a lot of the time, you think your program will run um, just as fast as the processor can run. So if my processor runs at 2 gigahertz, it will run that fast. If my processor runs at 1.5 gigahertz, it will run that fast. Actually, it turns out that most programs that we look at are what we call memory bound rather than processor bound, which means that actually they're much more reliant on how fast you can load data into a memory and to cache and then into a processor than they are on how many instructions you can compute at any one time. Uh, but we have all these the performance metrics for our computers. We have the clock speed, that's how fast a processor can run, a, how many instructions in a second it can execute. Okay. We have a floating point unit inside the processor which will run at the same speed, but it can maybe uh, perform multiple floating point operations at once. So modern uh, Intel CPUs will be able to do what we call a, a fuse multiplier. Add. So in a single instruction they can do a multiplier and an add at the same time. Right, okay. So theoretically you can do twice as many floating point operations as, as the clock speed of your processor because it can do two at once. Every instruction cycle it can do two of these operations. But more importantly we have the idea of memory latency, and memory bandwidth, and memory disk latency and, and disk bandwidth. So memory latency is how long does it take me to get a single piece of data from memory onto a processor. Okay, and then memory bandwidth is how much data at any one time can I load up in. So I don't just load up one single piece of data, I can load up large chunks of data, and that's the bandwidth. And different applications will be either memory latency bound, so they're dependent on how quickly you can load in individual bits of data into a processor. There might be memory bandwidth bound, which is they're going to work on lots of data and we need to load it up into big chunks one after the other and that's a very dependent on the performance of the processor or they may be dependent on the performance of the clock speed and the floating point unit. Uh, and of course if you write your programs in the wrong way you can even end up being dependent on the performance of your files, your file system. So if for instance you had a program where you wanted to load some data in from file and then do lots of processing of that data if you load all the data in at once, you open the file up, you load all the data in and then just work on it in memory, that's going to be much quicker than if you open the file, read the first bit of data, close the file, process that, then open the file again, read the, first, the second bit of data and process and that. So you've written your program, it works, they both work, but you can write it in a way where you're constantly going in and out of files and that can be very slow, or you can write it in a way where you go to the file and you just load all the data up and, and away you go. So all these different ways, you can write your program in a way that it works and produces the correct answer, but doesn't give you as good performance because you're hitting some of these performance bottlenecks like the, uh, the, uh, the uh, I.O. performance or the memory. 
So as I said, most com for computational science, most calculation, most programs are limited by what we call memory bandwidth. I.e., the processor can generally process data much faster than we can load it in, um, and that's that, that is sort of where we fit. Um, now there are ways that you can try and address this by writing your program in such a way that you efficiently use the cache. Um, but but it, this is just a reality of where we sit. Any questions? So if you are of the uh, you know, going to be developing your own software and interested in all these kind of performance issues, then we do run other courses which look in much more de detail at the hardware performance and how you write a program more efficiently, some of the ways you write programs. So we have these single node optimization courses where you can take a program and make it much more efficient by just changing some of the ways that you program. Um, okay. One of the other things that you may have heard of doing doing things with computers is something called Moore's Law. So this was a guy from Intel uh, who noticed a trend that has been um, that has been present for now about 40 years in hardware manufacturing in that every 20, 18 to 24 months, so every sort of year and a half to two years, the people who make the processors, the semiconductor manufacturers, were able to put twice as many transistors on a chip as they could before. Okay. This is um, mainly just due to them getting better at making transistors and making smaller transistors. But we've had this trend over, which has been very consistent over 40 years, that you could squeeze in double the number of transistors um, every two years onto a piece of silicon. Uh, what does that mean? Well, for a long time, that meant that actually you could make your processor go twice as fast every two years. Because doubling the number of transistors sort of meant that you could put more functionality on there, run them more quickly, um, and it meant that we saw we had this time where you went through the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, where processors doubled every, every um, the performance of processors um, doubled every every two years, uh, which, which is nice, which was nice for a long time. You know, if you had a program and you needed it to run faster, you could buy a new processor and it would run faster. The problem that we have nowadays is that actually it's very hard physically to make these processors run any faster. Um, and that's because the way you pro make processors run faster is you increase the clock speed, clock frequency. But the power used by a processor is proportional to the voltage squared times the clock speed. So you can only put a certain amount of power into a processor before it sets on fire. So you have a sort of thermal limit to your processor, the power limit. So if you're making the clock speed faster, then the only way you can stay within that power limit is to make the voltage you're using smaller. So the voltage is what you use in the transistors to switch between 0 and 1. 0 and 1. And we have got to a point now where it's very hard to make the voltage smaller because the transistors stop working properly. So they can't recognize this switch between 1 and 0. So this is the reason why processes aren't getting faster and faster is because we're just sitting within these thermal limits, these power limits of the process, and we can't make the clock speed faster. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're still getting lots and lots of transistors, more transistors every year onto a processor, but we can't use those to make the individual processes go faster. What do we do with these instead? Well, there are three things that we, people, processor manufacturers have been doing to try and use those transistors to make the overall processor go faster without making the individual processor components go faster. One is something called vector instructions, which are very important for modern processors to get good performance on them now. Uh, another one is Simultaneous multi-threading, and then the third one you should all be familiar with, and this is what we call multi-core processors. So the idea that within a single processor, instead of having just one thing that does the processing, we have many of them. That's because we've got all these transistors, but we can't make one big processor out of them, so we make a few little ones and put them together as a single processor. So what do these things mean? We have the vector instructions. Well, it turns out that for the floating-point operations we do, the, the floating-point hardware units we use, 
um, it's quite easy to make hardware that instead of taking one number and adding it to another number to produce a result, it can take four numbers and add all those four numbers together and produce four results. Or it can take eight numbers and add all those eight numbers together and produce eight results. It turns out just in the hardware, this doesn't need very much extra effort to do this. It's quite easy for them to build that. So the floating point units that are in modern processors now use this thing called SIMD vector instructions or vector units, which instead of taking one piece of data and, and manipulating it, it takes many pieces of data at once and works on them together. Um, so in this example here, we're taking four uh, pieces of data, adding them to another four and producing them four results. So in this scenario, for every instruction that we do, for every clock cycle we do, we can potentially do four sums at a time. And actually, the newest processes are Intel bringing out, you can do eight or 16 floating point instructions at any one time um, using these kind of vector instructions. Um, so that's one of the things we've added. Now, this, misses, this, is, this makes the overall floating point performance of the processor quite high. But actually, the only challenge of it is not all code easily maps into these kind of instructions. So for a lot of applications, although theoretically a processor can do lots of floating point instructions at once, the code doesn't actually map onto that well. So you only end up using, in this example, one of these. So even though it could do four sums at once, it only does one sum at once. And, and that can be an issue for us. The other thing that they have been known to do is this idea of symmetric multi-threading or hyper-threading, it's quite often called. So this is actually, well, we can add a bit of hardware to the processor using all these extra transistors to say, instead of running one thing at once in this processor, we're going to try and run more than one thing at once. We're going to try and overlap things. Um, and this actually comes about because inside the processor, we actually have more than one thing we can do at any one time. It, we're, we're called superscalar processors. So we might have a part of a process called uh, an integer unit, which does integer sums. And we've got the floating point unit. And we'll have a branch prediction unit, which does things like ifs and thens and, and do loops and while loops. And we'll have something else, a load store unit, which loads data up and stores it. So in any given instruction cycle, you can use all five of those things at once. right? But actually, if you look at most applications, they're not set up to use all five things at once. They'll be using the floating point unit and maybe the, the load store unit, but they won't be using the integer one and the branching unit and stuff like that. So the idea here is you add a bit of hardware here and say, actually, instead of running one program, which is only using a couple of these units, I'm going to try and run two programs or four programs at once, and they'll all use different parts of these units, and we can just use the whole process at once. And that's what hyper-threading is, or symmetric multi-threading. And actually, most Intel processors support this now as well. And Archer supports this. So in Archer, we have 24 cores inside a, a node, but it, each core can run two threads if it wants to. So you can actually run up to 48 things inside a node quite happily. But you have to turn, you have to submit the job in this particular way, which says, I'm using symmetric multi-thread, I'm using hyper-threading, turn that on and use 48 things in a node. In reality, so most processors do this, for scientific computing, this is not useful. Because it turns out that most of our scientific applications spend all their time on the floating point units, you can't share the floating point unit. So trying to run two things at once and both trying to use the floating point unit don't, doesn't really help. So although Archer supports this kind of thing, not many applications will benefit from running in this mode. So if you have a computer which says it's got 16 cores in it, but they can each run two threads in hyper-thread mode, you can run up to 32 things. Um, it's worth playing around and seeing if you get good performance, but most scientific applications you don't. They actually run slower if you try and run more threads on them, you have physical core. Not true for all applications. Uh, if you're doing something that's graph-based or something that's, which is maybe you know, processing genomic data and you have to do a lot of read and write the data to files and stuff, and the, the hyper-threading, the symmetric multi-threading might help you there. But for most of the core scientific simulation stuff that 
but it doesn't really happen. And then the big one is um, multi-core processors. So this is here, instead of having a single processor, which just has one set of units on it, we have four or eight or 16 or 24. And, well, in the case of Arch, we have 12 cores per processor, and there's two processors in the system. So each of the cores is itself almost entirely a separate processor, but not quite. So as you'll see in the diagram here, they're all inside the same sort of physical package, and they're sharing some things. So they're sharing a cache. There's a shared level of cache between the, co between the cores. They may have their own caches inside the cores. There's a shared level of cache between them. And also, they're sharing the connection to the main memory. So they're sharing the main memory connection uh, bandwidth. But that's pretty much all they share. But everything else, they just run as independent processors. OK. So in this scenario, I could run all the same applications on these cores, or we could run all different applications, and that would be fine. They're perfectly um, independent pieces of hardware. So this is an example. This is a little bit of an older example now, mainly just because I like pictures of processors. But um, This is an Intel processor, and it's probably quite hard to see on, up on here, but actually it's eight cores. And if you have a look, there's sort of eight individual blocks of um, functionality around the top and bottom edges. So those are the cores. This big chunk in the middle here is the cache. This is the L2 cache, which is shared between all the cores. And then the stuff down the edges are the uh, memory buses and the memory connectivity and uh, all that stuff. The one of the issues that this does bring up, especially in teaching something like this course, is what do you call things now? So we used to have processors. Everything was a processor. Each, each node had one processor, and that was it. Or you maybe had two processors or four processors. Now we have uh, the idea of processors, and inside each processor, various cores. Each core can run a program. Um, yeah, so we'll... So, as it says here, maybe we shouldn't talk about processes anymore, especially in this course. We should talk about cores and sockets. I don't like the term sockets anymore. But. I mean, at Archer, what we technically have is each node has two processors. Each processor has 12 cores inside it. But you can think of each one of those cores, if you want, from a programming perspective, as a processor, because it is a standalone thing which lets you run a piece of code. Piece of code. Gets slightly confusing. Right, okay. So, but, but that's standard processors. We also have other kinds of things which we can use for computational simulation, what we call accelerators. Things that are not themselves standalone processors, which you can't run a normal system from, but which can be used to make scientific simulation go faster. In this case, we mean things that can do lots of floating point arithmetic cheaply. It's nothing new, actually. If you go back to the 1980s, Intel would sell you a processor, an eight, eight, uh, x86 processor, but they'd also sell you an x87 processor, which was a floating point uh, coprocessor that you could plug in alongside, because a normal processor didn't do it. Here, what we're talking about is things like GPUs and, and Xeon Phi's. Um, and in the first instance, and certainly the first incarnation of these things, what we're talking about is a standalone card which plugs into the node, the hardware you're using, the motherboard you're using. Actually, if you go back to this picture here, I can't see it very well, but there's, there's a set of uh, connections down here called PCI Express connections, um, and the GPU or whatever you're using will plug into one of those. So it's on its own card, it plugs in, um, to the computer. They will have their own fast memory on them, so generally, especially GPUs, uh, they run something called GDDR, graphics memory, on it, and that's very, very high bandwidth, which can be good for our application. And they have a lot of floating point operation uh, functional units on them. Okay, so here's an illustration of why they may be useful for us in scientific computing. 
But these are old pictures now. These are sort of three or four years old if you look in terms of technology. But here is a picture of a, a standard processor where the pink things are the floating point units, the bits that I say we use very heavily in computational simulation. So when you're running your computational simulation, you'll be using those bits very heavily, but most of the rest of the processor you're not using, apart from this orange bit down the end, which is a cap. If you look at something like a GPU, they're a different kind of processor, but so this is a, a slightly old generation GPU. But you can see that these pink bits now are much, much bigger. So these are the bits that do the floating point instructions on the GPU. And much more of that peak chip is dedicated to them. Okay. And this is at the expense of some things. So it's the expense of things like caches and controllers and branch prediction units and all sorts of other things. That you need to run a standard computer, you need to run an operating system or a web browser or all these kind of things. But it, it does mean that for the silicon you get in, the power you're putting in, you're getting much more floating point out of it. Yeah? Is the shared memory on a GPU then going to be slower than uh, the cache on the processor? So the, the fast memory on the GPU is slower than the cache on the processor, but faster than the main memory on the processor. But the GPU will have, so each one of these little units in here will have a small amount of cache. Um, yeah. Okay, this is a, a different kind of accelerator, so this is not a GPU, but it's what's called an Intel Xeon Phi, or a Knight's Corner. Intel always have about five names their products, which is, gets really confusing, but this is what we call a K and C. And you can see the same kind of thing. It's got lots of small um, floating point functionality, but they take up most of the processor. Okay, so this is why accelerators may be of interest to us. Um, this is the new version of that, so that was the KNC. Intel have brought a new version out called the K now. I haven't got any pink things on it, um, but um, effectively it's very similar. Each one of these blocks here is two cores. Um, effectively the whole thing is taken up with floating point units, apart from these little black uh, horizontal uh, columns which are the caches for those floating point units. If we, just a, yeah, so, so one of the reasons that these accelerators are good is because they have much more of a silicon is used for floating point operations. Um, another reason that they're good is because they use fast, fast, well, when we say fast, higher bandwidth memory, and we've said that a lot of applications are memory bandwidth bound. So we have these two reasons why using accelerators are, are of interest. But it is worth for noting that accelerators have their downsides as well. So GPUs or Xeon Phi's have their downsides as well. Because you've made the processor simpler, they can't run all kinds of programs, or they can't run all kinds of programs efficiently. So there is a set of applications which run well on GPUs. And there's a set of applications which can't use GPUs very well at all. Just the way that the... Um, Computations are structured inside the program. GPUs are, are very well um, targeted to things where you're doing lots of regular access and, and regular computation on uh, big arrays, but not all applications uh, are like that. The other thing that's worth bearing in mind is that whilst accelerators look very, very fast, if you actually look at the underlying hardware, between that and a normal processor, something like a high-end GPU compared to a high-end compute node, if you use that GPU very well and you can use it efficiently, you may to get to go, your program to go two or three times faster on that than you would on a normal compute node. But you shouldn't expect GPUs and things like those to be able to make your program go hundreds of times faster. Because if you actually look at the hardware difference between a GPU and a normal computer, the hardware isn't hundreds of times faster than a normal computer. It's maybe five times faster or ten times faster for various things. If you look at the memory, for instance, between normal memory and this graphics memory, it's maybe got five times the bandwidth. If you look at the floating point performance, so it's maybe got five times the floating point performance. So 
Uh, a lot of people will tell you they take their program and they made it go lots, lots faster on the GPU. Well, that's probably because they needed to do some work on their program on the computer, the normal computer, to get it to go uh, faster as well. But they can be very beneficial for um, applications uh, as well. So there's a set of applications that work very well on things like GPUs. Uh, yeah, okay. So, so, the, so the, the, the last thing I want to say about having thoroughly confused you about the computing hardware is uh, what one of these, which areas of these do you have to write yourself into the program and which area of these will be done for you. So we've talked about how caches um, and memory performance is beneficial to programs. Well, you generally don't have to write your program especially to use a cache. Okay, the hardware and the compiler when you build your program will automatically use this cache. It's just done, done for you. You can rewrite your program in some ways to more efficiently use that cache. And that's one of the things we cover in the um, single node optimization course. But by default, you get to use that cache for you. Likewise, the vector units, I've said that the vector units inside the process can get your program to run 4 or 8 or 16 times faster if your program maps them well. Again, you shouldn't have to necessarily do write anything special to use them. The compiler should take your code and turn it into vector instructions, which automatically use that hardware for you. Again, with the cache stuff, there is work you can do to make that easier for the compiler, and we cover that in another course as well. The symmetric multi-threading, so this is running more than one program at once on a core. Well, you get that automatically, but you if you want it, you'd probably have to turn it on. So on a system like Archer, when we submit a job, you'd have to say, I want to run this with this symmetric model thread, this hybrid thread turned on. And then if we look at using all the cores in a processor or using accelerators like GPUs, well, there you then have to actually take your program and do some programming work to use them. So if you want to use all the cores in the processor, you'll have to do some parallelization. You'll have to use something like OpenMP or MPI to take your program and split it up and, and across multiple cores. Likewise, if you want to use a GPU or a Xeon 5 and all the cores inside those, you'll have to write your program in such a way that you can use them. So for GPUs, there are languages like CUDA or OpenACC or even OpenMP 4.5, which will use that, that, that hardware. For the Xeon 5, you need to have an OpenMP or an MPI parallelized program to be able to use that. So, there's a range of things where your program should automatically benefit from this parallels inside the processor. And then there's a range of things where actually if you want to use more than one core or you want to use an accelerator, you're going to have to take your program and parallelize it and do some work.